Hello, dear ones, it's Alice. Look at this, there's a ray of light coming out of the clouds here. There's gray clouds all, all around and, and here the sun is just um, sending its beautiful rays down towards the earth. It's very pretty. I thought I'd talk for a little while today about pencils and other entirely commotional things. So I'll start with pencils. Um, my father was an architect and when I was very small, five or six years old, I was very interested in what he did because I liked drawing. And um, so at night he would come home with a project that wasn't finished and he would be working on, at his drawing board in a spare room finishing up his ar architectural projects and uh, for that he would use um, a drafting table which is um, gee something bit me poor little thing and poor me <laughs> I think it was a ladybug larva I'm not certain um, anyway he would um, he'd be working on this drafting board and a drafting board is, is sort of like a table except it's set up at an angle so that it's easy to draw and you sit up on a high stool and you, and you do your drafting and so I would follow him into this room and try and figure out try to interpret the, the drawings he did the architectural drawings and so he had a, a pencil drawer in the, in the, in the um, table in the easel and in it he had his pencils for drawing and I remember I, I, I was very interested in that drawer also and so I opened the drawer and I pulled out a pencil a number two pencil that had a it, it was sharpened at both ends this was just as a young kid and the, the reason it was sharpened at both ends is because architects used to uh, uh, it, it would save time so their they pencil would get a little bit um, worn down and then they just flip it around and use the other side and then when they went to sharpen it they sharpen both sides and they'd be ready again so the, it was like twice as fast or nearly so so I picked up this this twice sharpened pencil and he grabbed it out of my hands and he explained this this story about a, a person that a young man who had a family like him had a family at the place where he worked, the architectural place, and he had stayed there late that one night, recently apparently, and um, anyway, recent to the story, and had fallen asleep while drawing. And uh, he slumped over the table and, and hit the pencil, and the pencil pierced his heart and killed him just like that. Well, needless to say, I was horrified. <laughs> and so, I, my mouth fell open and I, I said I, something like this. I said, are you sure he was dead? <laughs> and he didn't say anything. He just took the pencil and he just started away from me and he started working again. And I had plenty of time in my, my young childhood imagination and during that, that formative time when I was trying to figure out the rules of life <laughs> and uh, I was trying to set the example for myself for the rest of my life, I was making rules. And first I thought, I was thinking about this horrifying experience that my father had shared with me. <laughs> and, oh, it's going to start raining. <laughs> okay, to be continued in a minute. I'll talk to you all in just a second. Well, so this, this big storm cloud is blown up and it's for sure going to rain in a minute or two. So I'm seeking shelter in the little church. And right here on the porch, I'm hoping to weather the storm. So I hope that the rain is not too driving. We'll see what happens. Huh. Oh, goodness. Huh.
so so we were talking about this pencil and I was formulating plans for my life because at that early age I didn't have many plans and I knew I had to have some I was trying to figure out the laws of the universe <laughs> so the first thing I, I thought about this terrible incident was that it could be that it was dangerous to fall asleep. Maybe I better just stay awake all the time or I might die. <laughs> and so uh, that proved to be short-lived and not too practical. <laughs> so then I, I reformulated the plan and I decided that the problem was pencils. Pencils were dangerous. <laughs> and this sunk into my subconscious mind, my vital body, at that early age and impressionable age. And I have to say that even at the today, I don't like pencils. <laughs> I really don't. Sharpened or not sharpened, any kind of pencil, <laughs> mechanical or regular, I don't care. I don't care for pencils. And and so I don't I don't have any pencils around to speak lots of pens, but but no pencils. <laughs> and so this is an example of um, how, how we can formulate plans or come to conclusions in early childhood uh, and through our vital body and subconscious mind, or all during life for that matter, that may not actually fit the facts or, or suit us too well. You know? I mean, Pencils are okay when they're used properly, don't you think? But but I can't help it. I just don't like pencils. I mean, I could probably work it out, but it's not as important as some other thing is right now. It's low priority. <laughs> I have to figure there's a lot of other things that I learned in my childhood and all during my life that aren't serving me well. And, and I'm on a, a quest right now to find those things and and change them a little bit so that my life becomes more flowing and more more fluid and and more in the now and more happy. It doesn't get stuck in those little childhood traumas and those adulthood traumas. So that's the first story in the story of the consternational troubles. <laughs> and the second story has to do with another uh, thing that my father told me when I was young. I was just a few years older and he had been in World War II and apparently had a very uh, 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 traumatic experience there. So he told me about how he was in the Seabees, it's the construction branch of one of the military divisions and um, he had been on one of those um, barges that they used to haul supplies into Nor the Be Normandy Beach and uh, he was the person that was supposed to be in charge of that barge and there were maybe I forget how many 50 people uh, that were working on the barge right and uh, over the course of the Normandy invasion everyone on the boat died but him and that's all he ever told me about it but uh, you know in my majority in my adulthood I have to wonder how that affected his subconscious mind. Men are supposed to buck up, you know, and and see their way through all these sorts of difficulties. But uh, if the pencil incident, which involved just one death, had that much of an influence on me, I wonder uh, how much, how that terrible catastrophe in his life affected him. I have to wonder the results of war on men and consequently on the families that they go back to. I think it's far more far more far reaching than we actually suppose. And uh, that's consternational incident number two. And I thought I'd close with um, a final incident that doesn't affect me directly in this lifetime, as you will soon find out. But I have run across it amongst uh, children and sometimes adults. Um, 
and that has to do with manhood amongst men and young boys. And I think, uh, I'm not sure why it is, peer pressure I guess, but amongst young, young men there's a, a, a great emphasis on size of sexual organs, right? And I think it, it, for, for youngsters, that, that, it, that um, not too important thing has a tendency to stick in their subconscious minds and their vital bodies because there's such a role identification with that, that act of manhood. And I, it would be easy for me to say that it's not that important, but the problem is for them it might be super important. <laughs> So I had a notion that since the vital body and the subconscious mind are so influenced by pictures and images, so much more so than words, you could talk to them all day long and it wouldn't make as much difference as just one picture. So I thought, why not, you know, if there's, a, if there's an issue that keeps coming up in our subconscious mind, such as the pencil, or maybe it'd be the size of, size of one sexual organ, if you're a man, you know. Um, why not just do an internet search and actually find out, get a bunch of pictures that show different sizes and, and print them out, you know? And you may find that it's not such an issue as you thought. It could be that most people are pretty much the same, you know? But the pictures printed out and looked at once a day for a little while, I think will have far greater effect on uh, improving self-assurance than anything else because we're not really dealing with a rational mind here. We're trying to reprogram the subconscious mind and the vital body, which are like little kids. No matter how old we get, that's, that's just what they're like. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> I, that's a few thoughts that I have. I mean, you could say the same thing about, about women. You could say, the size of our breasts, for instance, you know, it's kind of major in the society today. But there are plenty of supermodels that are, that are small breasted. Not such a big deal. You come right down to it. So for ladies that have an issue about size, you could do something like that. Print out a bunch of pictures of ladies who are famous uh, and beautiful, who are small breasted, or whatever the problem is, you know, about us. We may find other people, just pictures of other people that are highly successful and very creative and very, um, very happy in the world who have similar features to us physically. And that's it on the terrible, horrible consternational problems for today. <laughs> and so I'm hoping you don't have any. So talk to you later.